May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's hard to imagine a more chastening text for a preacher than this morning's passage from the letter of James. Not many of you should be teachers, James writes, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Ouch, I don't like that. I don't like being wrong, asked my children. I like being right, especially when I've gone to seminary and read a lot of books and been a priest for a lot of years. In this text, James goes directly for the jugular, and the jugular, in the preacher's case, is the tongue. The tongue is the instrument of our craft which, with which we warble all alone on this stage, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. It's such a little organ compared with the rest of the body, says James, but powerful like the rudder of a great ship or a bit in the mouth of a powerful horse. And the same tongue that blesses God can curse a brother. You've no doubt heard the term bully pulpit. That's the term Theodore Roosevelt used to describe the presidency. Roosevelt meant it um, bully like in uh, bully for you. First rate, top notch. A terrific platform from which to, which to expound his great ideas. But in our day and age, the word bully means something very different, right? And bully pulpit suggests the kind of conspicuous and public authority that browbeats people into submission. And it is this second scenario James cautions the church against, and his warning still rings true. Because today, when platforms like Twitter are the bullhorn of choice and the comments section of online op-eds are filled with scathing invective, the church pulpit remains strikingly sheltered from even the mildest pushback. The preacher is granted respectful silence and unlimited airtime, no Q&A, no rebuttal from pundits, even if the sermon is wandering or reckless or hurtful or just plain wrong. Now, I'm not advocating a free-for-all in church, but you can understand, can't you, what James is worried about? How risky it is when any single human voice starts making loud claims from a bully pulpit about the meaning of scripture and the will of our unknowable God. The great biblical scholars argue endlessly with each other about what the Bible actually says, and eminent theologians debate what it actually means, and all the while these hard and fast rules of religion keep bending in the presence of love and compassion and science. So, if a congregation of people like this one wants to figure out just what this good news of Jesus Christ really is, that's a huge and holy task, and I pray for all our sakes that it doesn't hinge on a few Bible passages read aloud once a week and a 12-minute sermon spoken from this bully pulpit. Well, my hecklers left the room. <laughs> the process of Christian formation, of being fashioned in the image of Jesus, it's not like ordering Rosetta Stone to learn a new language. We can't just buy the tapes. Because our textbook is a person, Jesus, and we have to get to know him. And because our supplemental reading is this ancient, dense, and at times inscrutable Bible. And to top it off, our true teacher and guide is not on staff here at Christ Church. It's the Holy Spirit, and she shows up when she feels like it. And we are her pupils. 
This living, raw material being sculpted by all of it, Jesus, scripture, spirit, being molded in the community that surrounds us on any given day for a divine purpose we will never fully comprehend. Ah, so there you have it. Join us this fall at Christ Church Rye to be a permanent, imperfect work in progress. Chris tells me I can't put that up on the website. <laughs> It's hardly an appealing tagline in our slick and competitive culture, right? We offer no money back guarantee. There's no diploma or certificate of achievement and not one of you will ever graduate from church having learned all you came to learn. Apologies in advance to our confirmation class. In other words, our Christian identity isn't static, and it definitely is not passive. Following Jesus means signing up for a lifelong, hands-on course in the creative art of uncertainty. I made that up, the creative art of uncertainty. But it was inspired by a New York Times article called The Case for Teaching Ignorance. You may have read it, I think it was a couple of years ago, but the author's focus was on principles of teaching in the medical and scientific community. And not surprisingly, an extremely high value is placed on solid knowledge and stable data and linear breakthroughs, while ignorance is a dirty word, and uncertainty merely an obstacle to be knocked aside by facts. This philosophy, the author contends, can result in inertia, complacency and the mistaken impression that we know far more than we actually do. But there is another way. Teachers and students alike can embrace the limits of what they know, and when that happens, ambiguity and doubt cease to be liabilities. They become the very thing that ignites our curiosity and our passion, leading ultimately to innovation and change. So translate that into matters of faith. What if, instead of coming to church to get the right answers, we instead try our hand at the art of uncertainty? The very act of wondering and asking questions, which our Sunday school kids are doing right now, the very act of listening to each other and just trying things out may end up inspiring not only delight and discovery, but ultimately true transformation. And our children know this instinctively, right? Why? Their little tongues ask over and over again. No matter how accurately their parents think they've answered the question, right? Why? Asking why is a little kid's job, and the more annoying this gets for the parents, the more fun and productive it is for the kids. Remember Jesus teaching his disciples, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, Jesus deals with plenty of exasperated adults, and he rarely gives anyone the straight answer they're looking for. More often than not, he responds to questions from the disciples or the crowd or the religious leaders with another question of his own. Teacher, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Well, what did Moses say? Rabbi, who gave you the authority to do these things? Well, first let me ask you a question. John's baptism, human or heavenly? Jesus of Nazareth, are you king of the Jews? Interesting. Are you asking for yourself or did someone else ask you to ask me? And woe to the person who tries to smooth the hard edges of Jesus' teaching to suit their own purpose. In our gospel reading today, when Peter takes Jesus aside and tries to get him to back off from all this talk about suffering and death, Jesus shuts him down. Peter, the rock on whom Jesus will build his church, Peter, who tries so hard to get it right, Jesus says to him, I don't think Messiah means what you think it means, so you need to get out of my way. If Jesus' own disciples can't get the message when he is standing right there in front of him, it seems reasonable to accept a certain amount of confusion and resistance today. What do you think? 
<laughs> my tongue is still in overdrive, and no one's interrupted me yet except for that one little baby. So I'm, I'm going to take the bull by the horns in this bully pulpit and invite you into a little experiment inspired by our gospel passage this morning. Put yourself in Peter's shoes. How would you answer Jesus' question? Who do you say that I am? It's sort of a trick question. Peter finds this out the hard way. Because the closer you get to the truth of who Jesus is, the more is demanded of you. The closer you get to the light, the more you will be seen. How you decide to answer Jesus' question is going to reveal who you are, what you are becoming, how you put your lives and your loves in order. And I suspect there's no one in this sanctuary this morning who feels this more acutely than the church's newest priest, our curate, Michael Kurth, who was ordained less than 24 hours ago. He and I have promised to spend our days asking and answering that question with you, knowing that we will make many mistakes. We promise to preach the mystery of God and practice the sacred art of uncertainty in this bully pulpit, with our tongues on fire and that warning of James ringing in our ears, with you and for you. And we need you to hold us accountable to have high expectations of us and of each other, so that rather than becoming rattled by the limits of our knowledge about God, we learn to befriend uncertainty as the fuel of our spiritual growth. As our program year at Christ Church gets underway today, I hope you'll consider this sermon an invitation to the curious child within you because we are here to grow, not to spend an hour in an echo chamber. Our hard questions are signs not of our unfaithfulness, but of formation. And with practice and the grace of God, our tongues will be instruments of blessing, boldly sharing what we believe as opposed to what we know and why we believe it and why it matters. <laughs>